Are we on air now? Yep. Good. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And um, thank you for joining us. The, this is the first of our EMX uh, of the calendar year 2022. I hope that uh, everyone was able to have a restful, peaceful uh, break. Um, and um, that this uh, coming year will eventually turn out better. But as uh, you, as we all know, we're, it seems like we're back almost to square one and we are uh, under great restrictions again. So I think that this forum uh, is uh, still very useful uh, to, uh, for us to keep together, stick together, find out what's going on in electron microscopy in different fields, biological and physical sciences. And so I wish everyone a, 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 a wonderful and healthy and successful 2022. Uh, having said that, I will hand the bat on right over to uh, my colleague, uh, Wa Chu, uh, who will introduce the uh, biological speaker. Wa, please. Thank you, Bob. Uh, good morning and happy new year to everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. David Wester from uh, University of Washington. Uh, David uh, uh, came from a long way to come to America. I mean, he was uh, trained in the in, uh, in University of uh, uh, Marseille uh, in, in France, and he came to California for uh, postdoctoral research uh, at Scripps. And subsequently, he became a faculty at the University of Washington. Uh, uh, David has always uh, focused on the cryo EM research uh, on, on, on virus particles. And in fact, before the pandemic, he had the foresight of the importance of the coronavirus. Uh, I think he uh, published a very high resolution structure on the, on the spike protein of an alpha coronavirus uh, uh, before the pandemic began. And in the last few years, uh, last few years during the pandemic, he has been extremely active uh, in uh, pursuing uh, the, uh, the vaccine designs based on structures. And I actually look up uh, his, uh, uh, his website. He has probably close to more than 10 papers in nature and science last year. That means he's spill out one paper a month in Nature and Science. That's a very, very impressive record. Uh, he has been uh, selected as a investigator at Harvard Hughes Medical Institute uh, last year. And, uh, and this morning, he's going to uh, tell us about his latest development that we're all eager to help, how to do the uh, structural guided coronavirus uh, vaccine design. David, thanks so much for uh, joining us this morning. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction and for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be with you today. Uh, can you see my slide okay? Cool. Um, so as one mentioned, um, we have been interested in how coronaviruses enter host cells for uh, a, a bit more than seven years now. And we have focused our work on the spike glycoprotein, which as most people know now, um, is the key player for viral entry. It is shown he here in red in this artistic rendering. So I thought that before uh, telling you about the work we have been doing recently, um, I, I will try to, to summarize the work we had done prior to the pandemic. And to do that, uh, I think um, this movie will we, we do, we do the trick. We work with Janeti Waza to, to really summarize our understanding of how coronavirus spike glycoproteins made it entry into cell. Um, and that was done um, uh, based on SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV, again, before the emergence of SARS-CoV-2. So the spike is forming homotrimers at the viral surface, shown in blue, uh, gold, and pink. And the spike is decorated by glycans. And the domain you see moving here is called the receptor binding domain, or RBD. And it exists in a range of conformation between fully open and fully closed. When the RBD opens up, it can interact with host receptors, and then host proteases can cleave the spike to activate it. That leads to a cascade of conformational changes, fusing the viral and host membranes to 
allowed to initiate infection. So we are not able to capture all these states structurally. And um, so some of them are interpolation in between. But I think that that gives an overall idea of what we knew be before the pandemic. And, and I have to say that uh, so far, uh, all these findings uh, um, hold true for SARS-CoV-2. So as we all know, the reason I cannot be here in person today is due to the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 at the end of 2019, which has spread like wildfire. And um, a few weeks after the release of the first genome sequence, Lexi Walls in my lab developed one of the very first SARS-CoV-2 pseudotype virus entry assay, which is a surrogate virus that allows to ask questions about spike-mediated entry, whether it's receptor specificity or antibody neutralization. Based on the sequence similarity with SARS-CoV, we suspected that ACE2 could be a receptor, and Lexi indeed showed that ACE2 mediates entry into host cells. And to, ent to understand how the spike glycoprotein actually mediates entry of this newly emerged virus uh, at the time, um, we, de we decided to determine cryo-EM structures of the spike. And I just thought I was going to walk you through a few details of how we, 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 we did it. Um, we, we know that these proteins are prone to preferred orientation. And we have had quite a lot of success using a thin carbon over holes to alleviate this preferred specimen orientation, which is what we did here. Um, we like, we like pre-processing our data using warp on the fly, which is very, very uh, efficient for us. Um, and you usually use a combination of CryoSpark for 2D classification and Belion for 3D classification. I'm showing you here at the top um, a confirmation that we captured in which the three RBDs are closed, whereas at the bottom, the other half of the particles had one RBD, which is open, that I'm showing you here in each of the class. So that's similar conformational changes than what I just showed in the movie, suggesting SARS-CoV-2 also uh, adopted these changes, which we know by now uh, it is indeed true. Um, we, we found it uh, very useful to use CryoSpark for 3D refinement using non-uniform refinements, uh, but we love doing polishing using Reliant that or usually improves uh, data quality quite a lot, especially when we deal with tilted data, which was not the case for that data set. <clears throat> um, and finally, we usually bring the data back into CryoSpark. So Lexi and Young in my lab uh, used this approach to determine two structures um, of the spike, one in which the three RBDs are closed and one in which one of the RBDs shown here opens up. And this conformation allows to expose the ACE2 binding site and that's how the virus initiates cell entry. So these structures told us that the mechanism of cell entry was likely similar to what we had discovered for SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV with the RBD modulating access to the receptor. And they have been used by thousands of groups over the past two years to map the effect of emerging mutations found in variants, as well as to guide the design of vaccines and therapeutics. So very early on during the pandemic, we set out to understand antibody responses in infected individuals. And to do that, we teamed up with David Ecorti from Via Biotech, with whom we had already been working uh, prior to the pandemic. So very quickly, it became evident that we had three main classes of antibodies, RBD targeting antibodies, the ones targeting the N-terminal domain, or NTD, and antibodies targeting virus sites and the fusion machinery. I will talk only about the former two classes today in the interest of time, but I'd be happy to talk about the latter one for which uh, we have also done some work. So Matt, a postdoc in the lab, led the effort on NTD-targeted antibodies. And the approach he developed to study these antibodies was usually to form complexes with multiple antibodies, one targeting the NTD that was the, the subject of interest, and another RBD-specific antibody that allows, it is shown here, that allows to lock the spike in a closed conformational state limiting preferred orientation and allowing to use gold grid like ultrafoil, but also um, to um, limit conformational heterogeneity, uh, which was making our life simpler to study NTD antibodies. Um, here I'm um, circling the region of interest, which is NTD and the antibody bound to it. And you can see on this map that although the overall resolution is very good, these are 2.5, 2.4 angstrom resolution reconstruction, 
the region of interest is very disordered uh, and we could hardly resolve it. Um, so uh, we, we, we developed uh, a processing scheme uh, in which we uh, symmetry expand the particles and form a mask to focus classification around that region um, that allows to run local refinements and to recover the signal that was not visible in the overall uh, reconstruction. So these are the types of maps uh, we obtain with this approach. And as you can see, we can build an, a model unambiguously and that allowed us to study um, almost a dozen NTD specific antibodies. So we derived an antigenic map of the NTD that is here uh, represented with one fab fragment from each class, each antigenic site we, we discovered, uh, they are called independently. But what was striking is that all NTD antibodies that were neutralizing bound the site shown in red. We therefore coined the term of antigenic super site um, that was really the only site associated with neutralization. Um, and what we showed is that these antibodies are, neutralized, are, are protective in vivo in the hamster challenge model. So what I'm showing here on the x-axis is viral titers in the lungs of hamsters that have been infected um, with a control antibody or with an NTD neutralizing antibody at one or four mg per K. And you see that most animals are very well protected. But one thing that really uh, stood out to us was to see that a few animals were almost identical to the control group. So we wondered what's going on with these animals because this is not something we're used to seeing in our in vivo studies. So we sequenced the virus in the lung of these few animals. And what we discovered is that at the bottom two, the, 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 these are the virus, uh, these are the, these groups, there was a deletion of residue 144, which was not present with the control map or with the, the viral stock. Residue 144 is in the antigenic supersite. And it turns out that it's also part of the alpha variant, or uh, it's also deleted in the Omicron variant. And so what, what that told us is that we had likely emergence of a viral escape mutant, and that we recapitulated in the hamster challenge model, the viral evolution that is going on in the clinic. And we determine a range of structures of SARS-CoV-2 spike variants. I'm showing you a few here, highlighting the antigenic supersite in the NTD. And you see that there is a huge conformational viability uh, with transition from strain to helical in the Delta variant, for instance. So that really illustrates how plastic um, this, this NTD is, and that allows to mediate evasion from NTD neutralizing antibodies. And I'm showing you here a heat map of binding of a panel of monoclonal antibodies to the NTD in various variants. And red indicates that we have last binding, and you see it's really a huge problem. So although these antibodies can be potent and protective, uh, we think that uh, the viability of the NTD we find in SARS-CoV-2 variants make it too challenging to focus on uh, for therapeutic or vaccine design. Our BD antibodies um, um, are uh, very abundant when we clone them from memory B cells. Um, oftentimes we end up with a uh, preferred orientation, as I mentioned, specimen uh, preferred orientation, which we overcome in that case uh, using uh, tilting of gold grids. And we have tilted all the way to 60 degrees sometimes because this is the only way to, to overcome this preferred orientation. Um, but even when we do that, independently of the orientation of the sample, we can see on this uh, global reconstruction that because the RBD opens and closes, the antibody is bound to it has an intrinsic lower resolution due to the dynamic of that region. And because we needed uh, to be able to build atomic models to understand recognition, uh, we used um, a, a processing scheme quite similar to the one I mentioned for NTD antibodies with symmetry expansion when possible, focus classification and local refinement were able to recover very, uh, very high quality signal. And I'm showing you here an example which is not the highest reconstruction we obtained, but I really like that one because we derived it from 30,000 particles only or 30,000 asymmetric units. Uh, and here again, we could build a model unambiguously. So I decided to highlight one of these RBD specific antibodies, which we actually discovered very, very early during the pandemic. And that was uh, isolated 
from a survivor of SARS-CoV infection who was infected in Hong Kong in 2003, and we obtained samples at various time points after that. So the challenge was to find an antibody that would be cross-reactive and neutralizing SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and it was a really, really extensive amount of work from our collaborators at Via Biotech, but that was possible. And we showed as soon as they sent us the antibody that we had neutralization of SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2, and even a bat virus that is similar to SARS-CoV. We showed that this antibody, which we name as 309, uh, is protective in the hamster challenge. You see, we have completely complete abrogation of viral replication and determine cryo EM structures of this antibody bound to the spike glycoprotein and realized that it was recognizing the receptor binding domain independently of the conformational state. It can bind to the open and the closed state, and we obtain structures for both of them. Um, what's interesting is when we, we zoom in at the interface, there is a conserved glycan at position 343 in all sub viruses. And this glycan is part of the epitope and accounts for about 25% of the buried surface area. We can see the core fucose here is sandwiched between the heavy and the light chain and is really uh, accounting for most of the buried surface area contributed by the glycan. If we plot the sequence conservation of this epitope among viruses, uh, we see by the, as shown with a dark blue color that it is highly conserved. And that makes sense because again, it was isolated from the survivor of SARS-CoV infection and works with SARS-CoV-2. As a result, uh, this antibody is variant proof. So far, no variant have been able to escape neutralization by, by, by this antibody. Um, and we have actually analyzed polyclonal purified antibodies from a SARS-CoV-2 infected individual. And from the polyclonal mixture, we were able to obtain a structure that I'm showing here in which an antibody that is identical to S309 could be detected at the resolution of the study, which is about six angstrom. But even at that resolution, we can see the density for the glycan, suggesting that this antibody is very, very similar in terms of recognition to the S309 antibody. And that's telling us that these types of antibodies are also present in SARS-CoV-2 infected individuals. Last May, um, um, the, F the FDA granted an emergency use authorization uh, for this antibody that is now approved in Australia and used in the clinic worldwide. And its name is Sotrovimab. So because the RBD seems to be so important for neutralization, we also teamed up with David Baker in our department uh, to computationally design and characterize mini protein inhibitors um, that target the spike uh, protein, and I'm showing you here an example of one reconstruction with a mini binder called LCB1. And using our processing scheme, we're able to recover high resolution signal uh, for uh, this mini binder bound to, um, to the receptor binding domain that I'm showing you here. And um, in, in this uh, rebound representation, you can see that the mini protein is formed of only three alpha helices targeting the receptor binding domain and preventing ACE2 attachment. These proteins have very favorable biophysical features. You can express them in E. coli and just heat up the supernatant to 90 degrees and everything precipitates except the mini binder that remains in the supernatant. So that makes up for a very cost effective uh, mechanism of production. Um, and actually um, we have worked with David's group um, to uh, make multivalent mini binders designed based on the structures uh, and one of them that is ultra potent is about to enter clinical trials, which is the one I'm showing you here on the right hand side. So the RBD is clearly a very important target of neutralizing antibodies. And we derived an antigenic map from all the structures we determined. And I'm showing you here examples of epitopes and antigenic sites recognized, uh, which we classified based on the ability to neutralize or not to be immunodominant, such as the antibodies competing with ACE2 attachments, and also based on neutralization breadth. To obtain a quantitative understanding of the importance of RBD antibodies, we decided to deplete them from the plasma of infected individuals and to ask how much neutralization potency is dampened by this depletion process. 
when we did that, we realized that we were reducing plasma neutralizing activity by a factor of 10, suggesting that about 90% of the plasma neutralizing activity is accounted for by RBD specific antibodies, making it not only a very important target, but the most important target of neutralizing antibodies upon infection. And multiple groups after, after this showed that it was also the case after vaccination. So I hope I convinced you that the RBD is really, really important. Um, and uh, based on this data, we decided to design a vaccine using an approach that is completely different from the one used by big pharma. Because the RBD is really a key site of vulnerability, we thought that instead of using the spike glycoprotein in which the RBD is partially masked in some conformations, Lexi Waltz in our lab teamed up with Neil King in our department to display the RBD at the surface of a computationally designed protein nanoparticle made of two components. A trimeric building block shown here in gray, which was genetically fused to the RBD, and a pentameric component that is produced separately. And when mixed together, we have self-assembly to a uh, nicosahedral nanoparticle. So this, this is just a computational model. This is not a structure. Um, when we looked at it in negative stain, uh, we, we could see that the, this beautiful uh, icosahedral nanoparticles are formed. And in a preclinical study in mice, we showed that various flavors of our nanoparticles using various linker length, for instance, elicited much higher neutralizing antibody titers as shown on the y-axis than the prefusion stabilized 2P spike shown on the left-hand side that is used by most vaccines. We have actually a tenfold higher titers of neutralizing antibodies for all these groups compared to the prefusion spike. In collaboration with Bali and at Stanford, um, we evaluated our vaccine using multiple clinical adjuvants in non-human primates and showed that the vaccine protects against viral replication in the upper and lower respiratory tract, as well as against sign of disease in the lungs as shown in this PET scan as when we compared to unvaccinated animals that were challenged. So our vaccine is in the late phase three clinical trials and as 43% of uh, the population worldwide has not had access to a first dose of vaccine, um, we are very hopeful that the, the planned distribution of our vaccine through COVAX will help uh, meet the global demand for doses. So one question you may be uh, asking yourself is how good the vaccines we have been receiving so far are at protecting us from a new Sarbeco virus. What if SARS-CoV-3 was to emerge? How well would we fare? And um, so we have done experiments with protein subunit vaccine. I decided to show this experiment from Ralph Berrick's lab, which is done with an mRNA spike vaccine. And it, what, if we just focus on the group circle in red, we can see the titers of neutralizing antibodies elicited by a SARS-CoV-2 spike mRNA vaccine against SARS-CoV-2. They are very high and that's great, that's what we know. If you test these neutralizing antibody titers against SARS-CoV-1, you see that you have a reduction of about one and a half log, uh, which is actually quite a bit. Challenging these mice um, with SARS-CoV-1 uh, shows that the group that was vaccinated with SARS-CoV-2 spike in red is hardly different from a group vaccinated with a norovirus capsid, which was just a, a control group here, suggesting that if a divergent Sarbeco virus was to emerge, uh, we would probably not be very well protected, if at all, by the vaccines we have currently received. So the question is, how worried should we be about the emergence of a divergent Sarbeco virus? Uh, we know that S309 works with SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1, but Sarbeco viruses are a lot more diverse than the clades containing these two viruses. I'm showing you two other clades in pink and orange, and, and we know that it's pretty sure that we have only scratched the surface of the diversity of Sarbeco viruses in nature. So Sam Zepeda in the lab teamed up with Tyler Starr in the Bloom lab to show that the clade shown in pink here is actually able to use bat ACE2s to enter host cells. I'm showing you here entry with one allele from Rhinolophus affinis ACE2. 
what they were able to show is that when we make two mutations to this bad Kenya 72 virus, then we observe very good entry uh, into uh, human ACE2 carrying cells, suggesting that two amino acid mutations are enough for this virus to be able to utilize human ACE2. So we thought we should find tools uh, that would be even broader than S309 in case the divergent viruses um, cross the species barrier. In collaboration with David Corti, we did just that and found S2X259, which is an antibody cross-reacting with all cervical viruses we know of and neutralizing all cervical viruses for which we have an assay. We determined its structure, and that was a really tricky case in which there was we could not tilt enough to overcome the preferred orientation problem. So we ended up combining uh, tilting with gold grids and thin carbon over holes uh, to obtain the structure of this antibody that's work that was led by Ali Tortorici in our lab. You see on the structure that S2X259 binds on the side of the RBD uh, away from all the mutational hotspots that were found uh, in variants and variants of concern, explaining why it cross reacts with viruses as different as SARS CoV 2 and SARS CoV 1. Um, the antibody overlaps with ACE2 binding. There are few residues in common in the epitope and therefore blocks viral attachment uh, to cell surface. And we showed that it was protective in a therapeutic setting, which means after viral infection um, in the hamster challenge model. At the same time we were doing this work, we also found a very cool antibody in that work led by uh, Yong Jung Park in our lab that binds to the ACE2 binding site in such a way that it mimics the contact formed with, uh, with the ACE2 receptors. This antibody called S2K146 shares 75% of contact site with ACE2. So it's really a mimic and it's such a good way of targeting uh, the virus that when we try to isolate escape mutants, we could only find out of 32 different experiments a single escape mutant Y489H. And we work with Shen Willen. Uh, to isolate these escape mutants. And we wondered because ACE2 binding was dampened so much for this mutant, how fit was this virus? And by doing competition experiments between the ancestral virus in black and the escape mutant in blue, we see that the reduction of ACE2 binding is actually imposing a fitness cost. And after just one cycle, the ancestral virus completely outcompetes uh, the escape mutant showing that it's exceedingly difficult to, to escape neutralization by S2K146. So uh, in the last couple, two minutes, uh, I will uh, just summarize by showing that we have actually isolated a range of what we call broadly neutralizing sarbecovirus antibodies that work against various sarbecoviruses. Um, and around Thanksgiving, the emergence of Omicron was a pretty good uh, test of you know, how well these antibodies will fare. So John Bowen in our lab showed using a panel of vaccines that we had, plasma samples from vaccine, vaccinees with the six uh, main vaccines, uh, Sinopharm, Sputnik, and J&J uh, uh, &J showed that there was hardly any neutralization activity left, um, whereas uh, the same holds true for convalescent individuals. And when we look at um, Moderna, Pfizer, and AstraZeneca, we see a reduction by about 40-fold for uh, Moderna and Pfizer, around 20-fold for AstraZeneca, which is a greater magnitude of uh, immune evasion that we had seen for any variants before. But when we compare to SARS-CoV, we see that we are still uh, two-fold higher. Uh, and that makes sense because the RBD of SARS-CoV has 55 mutations compared to the Wuhan 1. SARS-CoV-2, whereas Omicron has 15 mutations, which is a lot, but not quite as much as SARS-CoV. And as I told you, we, we, that was a very good test for our broadly cervicovirus antibodies, because the idea that um, I have is any SARS-CoV-2 variants, any two SARS-CoV-2 variants are much closer to each other than SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1. So if you can broadly neutralize the two viruses, you're going to get the variants for free. And that proved to be true. Uh, if we look at neutralization mediated by all monoclonal antibodies in the clinic, S309, that is called Sotrovimab, experiences a two, threefold reduction in neutralizing activity 
whereas all other clinical antibodies last neutralizing activity against Omicron as shown in purple, and with the exception of one of the two uh, antibodies uh, used in the AstraZeneca cocktail that has a two log reduction in neutralizing activity. So we determine the structure of S309 bound uh, to uh, the Omicron spike and show that it's really uh, remaining away from all the mutational hotspots. There is a single mutation close to the antibody binding site, but the antibody accommodates it pretty well. So my last slide is just to tell you where we are headed. Um, again, uh, by trying to preferentially elicit antibodies that are broadly neutralizing against Sabico viruses, um, we have the opportunity to uh, make vaccines that, that will be obviously uh, uh, overcoming the emergence of variants, but also preparing us for a possible future emergence of cervical viruses. Um, and so this work, uh, for this work, we decided to uh, mix multiple cervical virus RBDs at the surface of a nanoparticle um, to obtain mosaic that will preferentially elicit these antibodies that are cross-reactive. And we challenged mice with SARS-CoV-1 that were vaccinated with the mosaic with four components. And we removed the SARS-CoV RBD from the vaccine. And we see we have complete protection against SARS-CoV-1 challenge. And that's work done in collaboration with Wild Beric. And we have now been optimizing the formulation of this vaccine. And last Friday, CEPI announced that they were funding the clinical trial of a sabicovirus antibody uh, a sabicovirus vaccine, sorry. And we are therefore very, very excited to be able to advance this new next generation vaccine to the clinic. Uh, I will stop here uh, by thanking the fantastic members of my lab uh, who work with me through the pandemic uh, and our wonderful collaborators whom I mentioned along the way. Um, and finally, I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Wow, David, thank you very much for these uh, comprehensive um, uh, discussions of what you have done in the last few years. It, it's, it's incredible how you use the cryo EM uh, to deal with this uh, pandemic uh, challenge. Very, very impressive yeah. indeed. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there are some questions uh, uh, from the Q&A. Uh, let me try to read out some of them and you can respond. Uh, so the first question is, what drives the rapid mutations in the, uh, the NAD domain? I think there are two factors. There is selective pressure from antibody responses. It seems clear that um, that's the case, but we do not really know the function of the NTD. We, we have still not understood how NTD antibodies work, how they block viral entry. Um, so because it's less functionally constrained than the RBD, um, it, it looks like there is a, an almost infinite uh, number of molecular solutions uh, to change evade neutralization by NTD antibodies without, uh, without penalty for the virus. For the RBD, we have seen again and again the same mutations coming up uh, in, in different variants. Whereas in the NTD, we, we, we have, again, completely different molecular solutions to the same problem. So it's definitely a combination of uh, antibody pressure and perhaps um, a lack or, or reduced functional constraint on the NTD. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the other question is, is there any way, for example, by chemical means to suppress the mutations? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, this is something that's ha happening. I don't think we can we can induce it very easily. Uh, preventing it, I'm I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. um, again, I, I think the NTD is just it, it is an important target. Uh, otherwise, one we would not see neutralization. Two, we will not see viral evolution. If NTD antibodies had no role whatsoever, there will be there will be no. Uh, pressure on the virus to escape these antibodies. Just they, they are not uh, over, um, they are not accounting for most neutralizing activity. And so clearly, uh, I don't think this is the best target to focus uh, for either vaccine or therapeutic design. Mm -hmm. uh, so you successfully uh, overcome the preferred orientations of the particle problem by tilting the specimens. 
uh, the question raises here, uh, do you try other ways of overcoming this problem, like you treat your grid differently with, uh, for example, amine amine growth discharge? Um, so no, we have not done amine amine. Uh, so we have, except that, but I think we've tried pretty much everything. So we've done gold grease with tilting. Um, we have uh, we have a chameleon instrument as well, which we tried. Uh, I have to say that thin carbon has solved 99.9% .9 of our problems. It's the oldest trick in the book. Um, and so uh, we have definitely not invented that. Uh, we, we have people in the lab that are really, really good at making thin carbon that is so thin that you, go, you can't see, it. well, the person making it sees it, but when trying to teach other people in the lab, other people say, well, I can't see it. And um, so Young, when he makes this thin carbon says, well, it is here, I guarantee you. And when he goes in the microscope, it is here. But it is just very, very thin. And for us, it does work very well. Uh, we, we first analyze the protein using negative stain. And the orientations you get in negative stain are the orientation you're going to get in cryo over thin carbon. So if you do not have preferred orientation in negative stain, you will not have preferred orientation over thin carbon in cryo. Um, chame chameleon would have been our preferred way. Uh, and uh, we, we bought this machine. This is actually quite expensive. Um, unfortunately, it does not help us uh, at all. Um, and even with detergents, uh, it, it has been very, very difficult to overcome preferred orientation with the chameleon. And all the tricks have worked better for us. OK. Uh, so another question is, uh, what decides the virulence of the SARS-CoV-2? Oh, uh, OK. There, there are going to be a lot of factors. Uh, if we look at the spike level, one of them is the activating protease. I did not uh, expand much on that, but in the movie at the beginning, I showed that the protease is involved in activation. And um, it, it, is, it, it is known. Uh, uh, it is known that uh, at the S1, S2 cleavage sites, uh, which is a polybasic furin cleavage site, um, uh, which is unique to SARS-CoV-2 in cervical viruses, if you remove this site, you modulate the, the, the transmembrane host protease involved in activation. If you have pre-cleavage during synthesis at S1, S2 by furin, that tempers to at the host cell surface will allow entry. And that's the, the canonical way of entering for this virus with an exception for Omicron, uh, but for all other previous variants. Uh, and removal of the furin cleavage site at S1, S2 alters proteolytic processing at S2 prime by tempers 2 and that has been shown to, uh, to reduce pathogenicity. So that's one of the factors. The other factors will be modulating uh, the innate immune response. So the, you, you really have a range of factors to look at to determine virulence. Uh, another question related to the variants. Uh, when you look at all different maps, uh, does any of these variants actually affect uh, the structural, uh, either the, the tertiary or the quaternary structures of the spike proteins? Oh, yes. So tertiary structure of the NTD, yes, no doubt. Um, we have uh, on the RBD, usually it's mostly a change of surface properties by changing side chains, but the backbone structure has not changed a lot, except in the Omicron structure. We have, uh, we, there are three mutations in, in, included in, in a five residue stretch. And this is definitely uh, modifying a helical uh, region in the RBD. Uh, but before that, we are mostly seeing uh, changes of surface in the RBD, whereas the NTD was refolded. Um, and there are some changes of uh, quaternary structure uh, with a few from RMSD. I'm not really sure how functionally relevant they are, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, one question uh, that like you to to clarify why your vaccine neutralized more effectively than the perfus than the perfusion stabilized spikes uh, from the mRNA vaccines. Um, so, uh, I, I think I need to 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 <coughs> sorry to bring some precision. We did not compare the mRNA vaccine, but we compared the protein subunit version of the prefusion stabilized two spike. Um, so the construct is the same, but the, deliv the delivery platform is different. Um, uh, so uh, we would love to have a head to head comparison uh, with mRNA vaccines, um, but usually companies are not too keen into having a head to head comparison of, of the products they are developing. Uh, for example, the vaccine panels we put together, 
uh, was without any help of any companies because absolutely none of them were interested in having us doing these experiments. Uh, the reason we think our vaccine performs so well and um, um, is, is due to the fact that uh, the RBG is really the key region for neutralization um, and therefore by focusing all antibody responses on the RBD, which at the surface of the nanoparticle is fully exposed, whereas in the context of the spike has some key epitopes that are masked or partially masked, um, may, may elicit higher titers of the antibodies we care about the most in the case of our vaccine versus the spike. So the way I think about it for a vaccine design perspective is that you are displaying the RBD in a spike or at the surface of a nanoparticle, but at the end of the day, you're just displaying the RBD. The, the, the rest, uh, is the other antibodies uh, are important, but from a quantitative standpoint, uh, not so much. Okay, and uh, one more question. Uh, why existing vaccines are ineffective in some cases? Um, if I, uh, I'm, I guess not effective, right? I mean, I think the vaccines we have are, are, are very effective. Uh, we find variants that, that escape. I'm not sure what the question rel relates to, if it's for some variants, for example. Uh, I mean, for Omicron, uh, for example, um, the higher the starting neutralizing antibody titers, the better off you are in terms of neutralization breadth. Hmm. So uh, in, our hand, in our hands, the, the Moderna vaccine has a slight edge over Pfizer in terms of in vitro neutralizing activity. Um, and, and so these two vaccines are really performing better because you start from much higher titers. So if you encounter a variant that is evading immunity quite a lot, uh, even if you have a 10 to 15 fold drop or even a 20 fold drop, uh, you, are still, you are still left with neutralizing antibody titers. Uh, three of the other vaccines we looked at were starting from very low levels uh, and therefore there's not much uh, left. So uh, I, I hope this answer, the question is very broad. So I hope that- Yeah, no, I think the question was meant that uh, why some of the vaccinated uh, individual also uh, be infected again? From the vaccine, okay. So I, I guess the clinical trials where uh, uh, we're showing 95% uh, um, uh, protection against symptomatic infection uh, uh, but that was uh, with the Wuhan one isolate, uh, and I, I guess some we are all we are all elicit, uh, eliciting different antibody responses, uh, and so there is some viability across individuals, and that's just to be expected. But I still think that the current vaccines we have are amazing, and I have benefited from them myself. Right, and one more question related to the vaccine: Is your vaccines uh, different from the water read? Uh... Pen for coronavirus vaccines? So the Walter Reed is using a ferritin nanoparticle platform. So it's an existing protein and it's a lower symmetry. We are using a computationally designed uh, protein um, with icosahedral symmetry. And the Walter Reed is using the spike, is displaying the spike, whereas we are displaying the RBD. Uh, I know the Walter Reed is in clinical trials. I don't think they are as advanced as we are. We are already at the at late phase three, but uh, it's great that we have multiple approaches because, again, as I mentioned, 43% of the planet has not received their first dose of vaccine. So we need as many vaccines developed and eff efficient as possible. Yeah, okay. So one more last question related to the image processing. Uh, you use the symmetry expanded uh, refinement procedures to deal with a very small volumes of your map. And the question is, what is the uh, smallest uh, fragments you can you you're able to use these procedures, and then also what microscope and what camera do you use? And I see it's basically grab a high basal. Um, so um, the smallest volume we have tried and successful and had were successful where the, the two variable domains of an antibody. So that's twenty five kiloton plus a small beta hairpin, uh, the, the, via, the flexibility was around the beta hairpin, so we could not take more of the RBD. So that, that was 27, 28 kilodalton was uh, the smallest. We have actually not tried smaller, uh, but that, that worked very, very well. That worked very well at the end, but with a lot of optimization of the mask uh, dimension and fall off. And the microscope, all the data I showed 
were collected on our Titan cryos uh, with a K2 for the first uh, 12 months of the pandemic and then a K3. Um, in our hand, the K3, the K3 has not improved anything in terms of quality. It has improved the throughput a lot. Uh, but we had we had a construction at 2.4, maybe one at 2.3 inch. Uh, we have not been able to to uh, uh, to do better with the K3. We just collect way faster. Good. In that note, uh, we thank you very much in this very uh, fascinating talk, and uh, we thank you for your efforts uh, in trying to keep us uh, safe uh, through you doing the cryo EM work uh, in in inventing uh, new vaccines. And uh, we all thank you, uh, David. And thank you very much. Okay, good. Thank you, uh, David, for wonderful presentation, very topical and uh, fascinating. Uh, before we uh, I hand over to the uh, physical sciences speaker, let me just say that uh, uh, we have set up uh, the next, the February meeting will be. February 7th, back to the first Monday of the month. Uh, and we have two, uh, of course, exciting speakers uh, then, Bridget uh, Carragher from New York City uh, Cryo EM Center, and Andy Miner uh, from uh, Berkeley, uh, who was uh, president-elect uh, of uh, Microscopy Society of America for 2023. So uh, that will be next month, February 7th. And, um, but now we have our uh, next speaker, and I'm very pleased uh, to pass the baton to Professor Yi Che, who will introduce uh, Zhao Qing. Please, Yi. Yeah, thank you, Bob. Uh, let me add my uh, Happy New Year to uh, all the audience here. Well, Dave uh, gave an amazing talk, uh, gave, up, gave us a very strong dose on uh, vaccine viruses related topic. Now let's switch gear, let's uh, move on to a physical science uh, and engineering talk uh, from Professor Xiao Chen Pan. Xiao Chen is uh, very well known, he's, uh, he's a good friend. He's currently a professor of uh, <clears throat> engineering, material science engineering at uh, UC Irvine. He's a director of Irvine Materials Research Institute also a uh, funding director of uh, complex and active materials. That's a uh, NSF MERSEC center. I'm a big fan of Xiao Qin's work over the years. He has done amazing work on uh, you know, high resolution imaging, correlate uh, material structure with properties, and particularly on oxide structure, fellow electrics, catalyst, 2D materials. He has been also spending a lot of effort on advancing the technique of, for example, 4D uh, stem and uh, momentum resolve vibrational electron microscopy. Uh, I think with that, Xiao Qing, let me invite you to the stage and uh, tell us about your latest and greatest. Thank you, Yi. Thank you for um, uh, involved uh, introduction as well. And very nice to see everybody here. And Professor Wa Chu, and heard him for many, many years. First time see, see you <laughs> via Zoom. Hopefully, we can see each other uh, in person um, sometimes this year. Uh, let me just start with uh, my presentation. So, I discussed with uh, Bob and uh, what should I focus on. Uh, uh, in terms of topic for this uh, uh, presentation. So we choose to focus on the uh, real space charge density mapping in the crystalline material, particularly for uh, defects by using uh, 4D step. Um, so before I um, talk about electron microscopy, I want to um, give a little bit introduction about ferroelectricity. As he just mentioned, so I've been working on ferroelectric for um, most of my uh, career. I started from a graduate school. Ferroelectric material is characterized by existence of spontaneous polarization. Uh, the polarization can be reoriented by uh, applied electric field. This characteristic of ferroelectricity 
make it very useful for uh, devices. Xiao Qin, sorry to interrupt. Yes. Just double confirm, did you share your screen? Oh, I didn't? Yeah, you have not shared your screen yet. No. Apologize. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Apologize. First slide, um, yeah. Right. All right. So this uh, I will talk about here. So fire uh, very uh, brief. Fire electricity is characterized by the existence of spontaneous polarization in the crystalline material, which can be switched back and forth by applied electric field. Uh, this make the ferroelectric material useful for electronic devices, particularly for non-volatile memory uh, devices. Uh, the polarization in the ferroelectric material can be oriented in different to different directions. Um, for a simple ferroelectric, for example, a tetragonal ferroelectric, polarization can only be aligned along the uh, c-axis or anti-c-axis, for example. Uh, on the right hand side is just an uh, example of uh, domain structure in ferroelectrics. Uh, on the top is a bismuth ferrite uh, growing on terbium scandate. A uh, bismuth ferrite has uh, polarization along body diagonal direction. Therefore, you have a domain structure with a polarization along uh, uh, one of the eight um, body diagonal direction. Therefore, the domain structure can be complicated. But if you're growing on a uh, uh, architectural growing on cubic uh, phase, and then the domain structure is more simple. On the bottom left, bottom right, you see the uh, video. This video shows that uh, a ferroelectric thin film, the bright layer growing on a substrate, which is much darker. In between, there's another layer that is a conducting oxide. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a LSMO, and then, uh, on the top, you have a, a needle, actually it's STM tip. By applying electric fields between the bottom electrodes and the tip, and then the electric field will be applied to the ferroelectric material. Therefore, the polarization of the ferroelectric right below um, the tip can be switched back and forth. So this is a, a, is a first demonstration of the ferroelectric switching. Uh, in the real time in the electron microscope was done by Chris Nelson when he was a PhD student in my group. Another very interesting and also very important question is that uh, the ferroelectric property depends on the suppression of positive negative charge uh, in the uh, structure. Uh, it we call dipole moment. If dipole moment can be measured directly uh, in the ferroelectric material, with uh, atomic resolution. If this is possible, then we can map polarization or map the domain structure uh, uh, directly within electron, using electron microscopy. So we uh, were interested in this and uh, have uh, um, uh, met quite uh, uh, interesting, uh, con uh, important contribution. Uh, the early student uh, I have is, uh, is, uh, is Dr. Wei Tian. And he working on this problem at that time, uh, year, around year 2000, uh, operating corrected TM has not yet been available commercially. And then he developed this uh, quantitative method uh, using the uh, atomic position measured by high resolution, resolution and then determine the position of each cation anion. And then use this information, you can determine the dipole moment of each unicell for barium partners. Uh, this is a very uh, 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 important work actually, um, but just uh, electron uh, operation corrector was not available and the image looks uh, a little bit uh, noisy, but method is, uh, is quite useful. And then later, later um, Chris, uh, uh, Chris Nelson uh, has uh, started working on a similar project about almost 10 years later using Berkeley's T1 microscope and which has a uh, very high spectral resolution, but also very stable. And then we were able to measure the atomic position directly by uh, hard F image. And then 
based on waste method and Chris developed tools which can be used to measure the dipole moment quantitatively and uh, map the spatial distribution. So this method become very useful and resulting uh, the discovery of many different phenomena, including uh, voltage and voltage arrays in the uh, at interface between ferroelectric and insulator, and also many different kind of uh, very interesting topological polar states, for example, uh, uh, hedgehog and hedgehog domains and vortices and vortices, and also being used. The method also has been used quite widely uh, in many electron microscopy group of the world. Uh, just mention two example. Xu Liang Ma from um, the Material Research Institute, Metal Research Institute in Shenyang, in Chinese Academy of uh, uh, Scientific uh, Chinese Academy of Science, and then they discovered this uh, vortex uh, antivortex arrays at the interface between strontium tartanate and lead tartanate super lattice. Uh, the su similar super lattice were also studied by Ramesh and actually by. Uh, Chris uh, uh, Nelson, and he uh, become poster in Ramesh group. And then uh, with a smaller repetition of the lattice, uh, um, uh, strong, young, strong him tartanate, lead tartanate, so called lattice. And then see very interesting voltage and the voltage arrays and from this, from this kind of very unique uh, polar structure. So without the uh, measurement, direct measurement of polarization, this kind of phenomena cannot be direct, uh, 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 viewed directly. So all these methods, you know, is quite useful, but we, for the determination of polarization, I may, as I mentioned, just measure the position of cation, anion position. But uh, we also know that the, polar, the electron cloud around nuclei in each, for each element, uh, is uh, is uh, it depends but its relative position depends on the um, uh, electric field, so that means the uh, total polarization of uh, ferroelectric material depends on both ionic displacement and electronic um, contribution we call electronic dipole moment. So in the previous example, we only measure the uh, ionic part. In order to measure electronic part, we have to Develop method that which is sensitive to the electron distribution. Uh, that is a one motivation to measure charge. There's an, another uh, very uh, uh, interesting problem exists in oxide header structure is um, like a, a space charge at interfaces. Uh, one exam important example is the two electron gas or two electron hole exists at the polar, long polar oxide interface. This phenomenon is also exists in other semiconductor. Um, STO LRO interface shows uh, two electron gas was discovered by uh, Harry Huang and Dan Miller uh, many years ago. A similar phenomena, like a two electron gas or whole gas, should exist between the inter at the interface between ferroelectric and uh, uh, long uh, uh, ferroelectric material or insulator. Uh, because uh, ferroelectric uh, domains, if the polarization terminate at the interface, uh, can be terminated with a pointing down or point up, then the interfacial bound charge will be different. And therefore, the ship trap the free charge and so that from two electron gas or two electron hole depends on the orientation of polarization uh, at the interface. So th these are expected. The microscopic measurement always are contradicting. Some people reporting, oh, this is true. There is a two electron gas or two electron hole and ferroelectric is at the interface. But some say, no, this is not true. We did a lot of measurement, but it is always uh, insulating. So we did, uh, recently we did uh, two um, different kind of experiments. One on bismuth fluoride turbine scanner interface. It is also a ferroelectric insulate interface. Uh, you can see that it's a very nice vertical domain structure, but the, the, each domain uh, will have a different uh, bound charge uh, from positive to negative. And then we were able to make cross-section TM sample from this kind of a domain, domain structure and then measure the uh, uh, current across a, a cross cross-section uh, interface sample. And then we see that the interface is uh, conducting when you measure along the stripe of the domains, but will be insulating if you measure ac 
across the domains. So this means that the anisotropy of the domain structure play a very important role. Another work actually in the same year, another a same student, Yi Zhang, and did this. They measured the interface uh, between PZT and STO and found that this interface is uh, conducting when the polarization in point down to interface and then there's the electron gas formed at interface. Indeed, this electron gas is uh, polarized, that is being polarized and it's a ferromagnetic uh, to electron gas. So I'm not gonna talk about details, but this just mean, uh, means that it's very important to confirm this directly by measure electronic charge distribution in local region, especially in the inter uh, at interface. So this is represent an important challenge for electron microscopy. Okay, so by um, for experimentally to measure uh, charge density by electron microscopy or other analytical method is not uh, uh, new. So for example, STM scanning quantum microscope can be used to measure uh, charge quite effectively, but that is a surface method. They don't know what happened below the surface layer. X-ray diffraction and converging the electron diffraction have also been developed to measure charge, but this used the uh, fitting of the structure factor of the crystal. And also the, if the measurement is sample average, means that that doesn't have a, a high special resolution. Uh, with the development of electron microscopy, uh, besides the technical development like operation corrector and monochromator and better detector and so on, there's also uh, uh, some theoretical considerations, theoretical development. So electron diffraction uh, for uh, in the nano prop, for example, in the stem, uh, actually it's quite interesting. So the electrons interact with a crystalline material will transfer its momentum to the crystalline uh, atoms in the crystal so that you, you can recording the diffraction pattern, evaluate the, uh, the uh, tran uh, uh, qu uh, momentum transfer. And then if you can measure momentum transfer when the electron, for electron prop um, um, scanning at each point, if then that if momentum transfer actually is directly related to the local electric field in the sample. In other words, by evaluating the uh, 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 momentum transfer, you will be able to map electric fields locally in the crystalline material. This was done by uh, Miller uh, about few, uh, many, uh, uh, about uh, uh, seven years ago. So we were very over inspired by this uh, technique and also uh, benefited by it. Uh, uh, the development of the operating character and uh, a better electron detector. So we think about if can we use the uh, uh, stem to measure the, uh, to map the dipole moment, no, not dipole moment, the mo measure the momentum transfer, and then to um, measure the electric field in a local region of the sample. Actually, this has become possible. We first did a uh, simulation see if whether or not this is a, a, a sensitive enough to, 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 to be used experimentally. So we use a strontium tartanate, which is a cubic is insulator. And then we simulate the 4D uh, uh, stem data. Actually each data point is uh, just a converging beam electron diffraction pattern. And then, you know, prop is a, a scanning across uh, the sample and with a wide, uh, small uh, steps. And then you can see this magic diffraction pattern uh, has been ob uh, obtained. This is simulation. And on the right hand side, it's just uh, enlarged from the two columns uh, uh, for the scanned uh, dot. You can see that the momentum transfer actually is quite interesting. It's a pointing to the center of the atom, you know, pointed to the same center, which is here. All right, this is a uh, 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 one uh, data. Uh, when if the Momentum uh, transfer is uh, uh, determined. And then we can use this relationship proposed by uh, Miller, and then can calculate local electric field uh, around a nuclei for each individual atom. This is a strong uh, position, okay? 
So this was done by Chris uh, at Diego and uh, before he doing experiment. And then after you obtained um, the uh, whole map of the uh, momentum transfer and then you can uh, obtain the electric field with a high spectral resolution. So this is a huge whole unicell of strong internet. Um, okay, that in, it was very uh, encouraging uh, by uh, sim simulation. Then we run experiment. Again, we use a strong internet as a model experiment, model sample. And then uh, using this, uh, um, using uh, 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 the, or this on the left side is just uh, the total intensity of each uh, uh, diffraction pattern uh, plotted. And that is looks very similar to um, hard F image. Uh, on the right hand side, each uh, pixel is replaced by uh, a, a shrink uh, diffraction pattern. You can see that if you enlarge one diffraction pattern and then it's shown on the, on the right, so it's a very nice uh, high converging angle uh, diffraction pattern. Okay, so by evaluating the diffraction pattern, actually just uh, like uh, calculate average momentum uh, uh, for each scan point, which is equivalent to the uh, evaluate the center of the mass or center of weight, and then you get this uh, uh, electric field um, uh, uh, using this relationship. So according to the Coulomb law. If you know the electric field distribution and then divergence of fields were related to uh, to charge, right? And then you can just get uh, uh, obtain charge distribution uh, in this uh, uh, area. Okay, this is very uh, quite straightforward. Right, with this method, and then now we put data together. So on the left is a structural model of strong hematotonet, and then next to it is the electric field measured using the method I just described. You can see that for each atomic pro uh, uh, projection of each atomic column, you can see that the field is a leaving a, a error is a, 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 is a pointing away from the center of each atom. So this is a very reasonable. And also strong hematotonet is cubic. Therefore, there's a no anisotropy. On the right-hand side, it's a similar material, but it's polar. This is a bismuth fluoride, which has a fireelectric fire electric, uh, uh, polarity. The dipole moment for bulk bismuth fluoride is pointing to uh, one of these uh, body diagonal direction. Now you see that electric field map of bismuth fluoride. You can see that the field is stiff, distributing is different from strontium tartanate. Clearly you see an isotropy. This is a donor you can see here, uh, uh, and then the red that is a, is a, is a, is a, uh, indicating very strong field. And um, so this is clearly indicate there is a, a dipole um, moment uh, in each unit cell, and this is uh, due to the distribution of the uh, uh, bonding uh, electron. It typically, is a four a six s electrons in a Bismuth, which is a uh, from non pair, which is resulting in the ferro electricity according to first principle calculation. With electric field determined experimentally, we can measure uh, the electron charge density, as I mentioned, just using uh, Coulomb uh, law. And then uh, uh, in the bottom, this uh, color map shows the charge density distribution. Uh, for strontium tartanate. You can see that the charge density has a very uh, uh, nice uh, um, uh, cubic symmetry. Uh, this is a no ferro electricity. But for bismuth fluoride, we can also obtain charge density distribution uh, according to the field uh, measured. You can see that the electron pocket, it is not uniform. And there's uh, uh, many regions where you have a very uh, 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 significant accumulation of electrons, or electrons is not really uh, uh, symmetrically around the nuclei. Uh, it's from an uh, interesting phenomena. So this explains uh, how, why this material is no longer uh, um, a full force symmetry. And also this will give you a clue about how the uh, dipole moment being formed and how this is related to the uh, all-shell electrons in the uh, fire material. 
Uh, because this is was the first experiment uh, done uh, at atomic scale to probe local charge density. And we want to, uh, we talked to theoretical uh, coll uh, colleague uh, who is a uh, Professor Ru Tian Wu, who is an expert on DFT calculation. So we calculate, uh, he calculates the charge density of the electric field of two different materials. And this is just for simple comparison. On the top is the charge density for strontium tartanate, non ferroelectric, and bismuth ferrite, which is a ferroelectric. And the bottom uh, is a corresponding uh, theoretical simulation of the charge density. You can see strontium tartanate that looks very, very similar. Uh, for bismuth ferrite, that looks some similarity, but if you look at details of electron pocket, it does not match exactly. We discuss about this, and Professor Wu wouldn't think, uh, 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 feel comfortable, think you know, this theoretical calculation is, uh, is a perfect. Um, and experimentally, um, uh, we also know that this is just uh, the early development of the method. And uh, uh, with uh, the accuracy for charge density mapping still depends on many uh, 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 facts, such as the prop size is critical. With improved prop size, and then accuracy will become better. So this work was uh, done by um, uh, Wenpei Gao, and who was postdoc in my group, and the graduate student, uh, Chris Adiago, he just graduated two months ago, uh, when Pei became professor at NC State about a year ago. All right, so with the charge density being measured, uh, being determined, we, then we can uh, evaluate charge distribution quite easily. You can use the same method as uh, theoretical people use, uh, 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 beta charge analysis. Uh, you can also just simply integrate charge and then with uh, 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 from small region and then to calculate the center of the positive charge and center of negative charge, this charge, including ionic charge and also electronic charge. And by doing this, we can determine the center of positive negative charge and center of positive charge for each unit cell, and then measure the distance separation between the opposite charge. And this will allow you to determine the polarization in a similar way as I introduced in the beginning, uh, the work done by Wei Tian about 50, uh, 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 almost 20 years ago from now. So it's, it's a quite interesting. So the polarization determined by using 40 stem is more close to the value uh, for the bulk material determined by microscopic, microscopic measurement. So this if, uh, indicate that the 40 step is quite useful uh, to determine the total uh, charge of the system, uh, such as determination of the dipole moment uh, in the fire lecture material. Using better charge analysis, we can obtain much more information from charge density map uh, obtained by 40 steps. So I'm not going to talk about the details and uh, application of uh, uh, better charge for 40 stem data. I just want to um, uh, 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 summarize the results by analyzing the interface between strontium tartanate and uh, uh, bismuth chloride, because this is insulator ferroelectric interface. Um, so uh, our second uh, uh, figure is just a hard F image, show very clearly two different materials because strontium tartanate is lighter and bismuth chloride, bismuth is very heavy. So you can see very high contrast. So the interface is very sharp. And then this uh, uh, green red map is an electric field distribution. Uh, you can see that across interface, the polarity of bismuth chloride gradually vanish and then uh, strong hue tartanate uh, become uh, uh, symmetric. But uh, around the interface, you can see the polarity also penetrate into strong hue tartanate a little bit. Most importantly, the charge density at interface indicate that there is accumulation of negative charge electrons uh, uh, concentration it's higher reach at this interface because the polarization in this material is pointing towards the interface, okay? So, um, and then on the right-hand side, by analyzing the 4D stem data, you can determine the structure uh, distortion, you know, how the, you know, the unit of the crystal and change. And also you can, 
calculate the rotation of oxygen octahedral, which is a characteristic of this process, proskite structure. You can see that the structure distort, the structural distortion and oxygen octahedral is quite along uh, a match with each other very well. The uh, range of the change is about uh, two to three unit cells. And then the charge separation, the separation between positive charge and negative charge actually is different. So it starts much earlier in the ferroelectric material and then gradually go down and then shoot the plateau at the interface and then winding down and the two match strongly tartanate. So this is important. That means the electronic property at the interface is different. And also dipole moment will become smaller from, from the interior of barium bismuth chloride and then gradually reduce and then still keep a value at the interface and then uh, uh, vanish when approaching to deeper, deeper into the strong hue tartanate. And charge state measurement is also quite interesting. So we can measure the charge for each iron oxygen column and titanium oxygen column in the 100 direction. It is interesting that both bismuth fluoride and strontium tartanate, this B site plus oxygen charge decreases at interface. So this indicates that there is a, 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 a electron enrichment at interface which is responsible to the formation of the two electron gas formed at this interface. This was also uh, 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 confirmed by the measurements of uh, 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 electron charge density in the bulk materials and for the, thing, uh, for the, for the uh, sharp interface. Okay, so that, that was an application of uh, um, 4D stand for one type of interface. Uh, I'll just mention that for uh, this method was also uh, uh, applied to uh, similar uh, interface bismuth fluoride, but not instead of strontium tartanate. Strontium tartanate is a long electric and also cubic. But with a uh, turbine scan, scan days, we can make a map bismuth fluoride with a very nice trap domains, as I show you in the first slide actually about ferroelectricity. So with this, you will have a interface with alternating polarizing down, up, down, up. And therefore we expect you have interface with a, 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 positive, a positive bound charge, negative bound charge alternating. This should result in electron and whole uh, 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 gas. So at this interface, actually this is confirmed by the 4D stem analysis. We see that when the polarization is uh, up, we have uh, a whole electron whole a whole two D whole gas. When polarization uh, pointing downwards, we have electron two uh, D uh, electron gas. Um, so I'm not going to talk about details of this if you are interested in this, uh, in this uh, paper, question paper, just published quite recently. Um, so this is the evaluation of the space uh, uh, charge across two type of interface. So this is uh, the red curve is uh, up, polarizing pointing up, and blue is uh, pointing down. You can see that there's a two opposite charge, uh, uh, free charge uh, at interface means two different kinds of uh, 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 electron or whole gas exists in this system. And uh, this method, uh, this uh, uh, phenomena is also um, uh, complementarily uh, studied by EOS in the same sample by Lyon EOS and they have a same conclusion. All right, so at very last, I want to uh, discuss a little bit about uh, um, what do we measure uh, by increase the prop size in the 4D step. So for the previous example, we use a highly convergent electron uh, prop uh, because we want to get highest special resolution. Typically, the converging angle is uh, 30 milli radius or larger. The prop size is about half uh, unit cell, half, uh, half of atom. Okay. All right, so if you increase the size of the prop 
and then you will not be able to probe the details of the within atomic column of the average of many unit cells. I'm going to run this very quickly. You can do a hard F image and then you can map the polarization in this very nice uh, super-lattice strontium titan light titan as Ramesh studied. You have a scheme, uh, schemion and fortis antibodies uh, pairs. So this is not surprising now. But now we can measure electric field with a, a smaller uh, converging angle. And then we can see that you see the polarization vortices are schemion, and then you can also see the field distribution. They are alternating from one uh, vortex to another vortex. So I just want to um, shoot this here with a smaller uh, probe, and then you can probe in the electric field around, uh, in uh, a near that one atom position. But if you have a larger probe size, you average it out. You do not see the uh, anisotropy around each atomic column. You want that I'd be able to see the bonding characteristic. However, you can measure total average electric field. So that is also useful for the especially evaluating of the uh, interfaces in the hydro structure. Let me just summarize uh, what I have uh, uh, presented here. By using 40 stem, in this, for this uh, particular method, we can determine electric field and charge density with atomic resolution in the real space. Using this method, you are able to evaluate the space charge at the interface at a single defect, and also uh, see what the correlation between electronic properties and the structure and so on. And then there's uh, many different ways to use this uh, uh, method, and you can also further uh, uh, develop the, the method that are uh, suitable for specific, specific, specific problem. So here's I just two example for this uh, vortices arrays. And so that is uh, still have a lot of things to explore. Uh, let me just um, thank to um, the uh, student and postdoc who are working on this problem. And Chris Adiago just graduated. He developed the method and uh, together with uh, Wenpei Gao and also new student Huan uh, Xun is uh, continuing working on this. Uh, uh, project and uh, make a lot of progress uh, uh, in the other uh, system. Um, I appreciate um, collaboration with Professor Ru Jian Wu for first principle calculation, Professor Daryl Schlong and your phone near providing MBE samples from this model study, and also Professor Long Ching Chen uh, for um, uh, simulation uh, is a phase field. The funding for this work was from uh, DOE and NSF. Thank you very much. Oh, Xiao Chen, thank you for the fantastic talk. The results are just uh, completely amazing. It's so great to see uh, your subatomic scale level of uh, <laughs> resolution mapping out the electron density distribution and so on. Um, there are several questions, I think, from audience. Maybe let me ask mine first. Uh, this is related to first person's question as well. Uh, in terms of sample shouting to look at this beautiful polarization mapping uh, and, uh, and electron density mapping, uh, the thickness of the samples, uh, you know, how thick is that? And uh, my question extend into, well, you know, there's a lot of 2D materials right now, sing single atomic layer uh, thin samples. Uh, would that be possible if you have heterojunction inside the layer, right? To to really look at like single atomically thin layer. Uh, so it would be good to see your view on the the sample thickness effect. Yeah, very good question. Um, actually, um, we we did all the analysis about uh, you know to what extent or to what thickness of the sample this method is useful. I mean, the uh, uh, sub armstrong resolution charge um, um, density mapping. So we, we, we have a detailed analysis and, and Chris did this, it's just published uh, in this paper. So I'm just uh, using this to emphasize stuff. So you see when electron uh, prop uh, pass through the surface of the TM specimen will interact or be affected by the electric um, uh, crystal field in the sample. And that its position will also 
gradually uh, change when the electron probe propagates through the specimen. So I did this analysis and also you know, it depends on the focus and also for the stem imaging depends on you put your focus on the top surface or the bottom surface or the middle, okay? So um, instead of talk about the whole details of this, I just want to answer your question. So quantitative analysis, uh, the linear relationship for the charge transfer, for the momentum transfer is valid when the sample is for this particular process, the bismuth is very heavy, lead also very heavy. For this particular sample, so it's uh, smaller than five or six nanometer. And then you have a very good linear relationship. And then this quantitative evaluation will valid. If you go to higher thickness, uh, the thicker sample, if your ele the element is lighter, and then you may still go to thicker sample, but generally you will lose the linearity. But quanti qualitatively for the field distribution, that's still valid. But quantitative charge density uh, uh, mapping, it is uh, 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 only valid for very thin sample. But this is uh, for the heavy element. You know, for the 2D materials, if you have a, a, a light element, that typically is, it, most of the 2D material will not be a problem, even for molybdenum disulfide, for example, or tantalum. But you know, five or six nanometer is very thick for 2D material. So uh, 2D material is a great system to uh, to study using this uh, method. Yeah, that's great. So related to our chain of home audience is, uh, uh, one person is curious about uh, if you go down to very light element like lithium, <laughs> Uh, you see there's a lot of battery people probably in the audience right here. Uh, this similar type, type of study, uh, what's the challenge uh, to look at lithium? Lithium is very challenging. I wouldn't say uh, uh, 40 stem would be very powerful for uh, study lithium, but there's a hint. So even for um, this uh, uh, oxide, you see bismuth of uh, iron oxide, you have bismuth very heavy, oxygen very light. The typical uh, hard depth image, you do not see oxygen at all. But if you use IDF, you do see, but because you adjust the scattering angle of uh, uh, electron scattering. Um, but that, that is it's not very uh, good way to do the quantitative analysis. For this stem, you have, uh, you, 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 you study the, the diffraction pattern, including many, many scattering, scattering angle. So you get more sensitivity. So you clearly see oxygen in the proscite, for example. But for lithium steel, I think it's, it's not good enough. But actually we have a very good uh, uh, improvement um, in detection of lithium recently by studying the lithium ion battery material. So we found that the combination of EOS, um, core loss EOS and the vibrational EOS will be able to solve the detection of lithium uh, because uh, vibrational EOS is sensitive to light elements because energy is higher. And uh, so we, we just, we're still working on that. Um, we can discuss this later, we'll have a more progress. Yeah, thank you, Xiaoqin. Um... So another question is, uh, can you measure the magnetic field maps also using 4D STEM? Very good question. There's a lot of challenges for electron microscopists, uh, you know, for into determining the electronic magnetic property of the material. Uh, there's a, for 4D STEM, there's many other methods developed, okay? We're not talking about vortex beam others. But for 4D STEM, it, it, it should consist of uh, you know magnetic information because you know electron momentum transfer both on depends on the electric field and the magnetic field because of Lorentz interaction, right? But how to separate this? Uh, I think that is a quite big challenge for uh, uh, a technical challenge. Uh, but I cannot go out for the future development. I think we need to have a smart student to uh, to look into the details. 
Yeah, uh, the same from the same person. I think uh, we have uh, an audience very active in asking great questions. <laughs> um, so, uh, have you also thought about the uh, the effect of light irradiation on the electric field maps of uh, you know your your measurement? I think it's very interesting experiment, of course, right? If you can input light, uh, we have Jen Diane right here also. Uh, as a co-host, uh, Jen is very interesting in this type of experiment as well. It will be good to see your thought. Uh, if we, uh, the question is whether or not the electron radiation damage could be a problem for the 4D set. Uh, well, I think maybe this question can have twofold. This electron beam effect is also guys to just optical photon coming in, maybe more of the for the future study having the uh, light illumination to excite uh, uh, your materials. Yes, oh, okay. So, uh, um, okay, uh, we will probably not talk about uh, uh, radiation damage thing. That is always an uh, uh, issue for electron microscopy. But for the photon excitation, that is very interesting uh, uh, question. And also, this is an interesting research topic. Um, so, so I think it's, it's interesting to have a light uh, in, uh, illuminating on the TM sample and then do the 4D stem, see how you know, electronic structure and uh, charge change, for example, the catalyst, you know, by photocatalyst, for example, that's just not. So I think there's a lot of possibility, but remember 4D stem take a long time to recording, uh, to, to collect data. Uh, so the stability of the sample and also the, uh, the, the whether or not sample is robust enough for an electron beam. So that is a lot of challenge, but at a low temperature, maybe very helpful. Yeah. Uh, Xiaoxin, maybe one last question. Uh, does the 4D stem has a better spatial resolution compared to IDPC? Oh. Um, so special resolution, I would say is a 4D stem is that depends on the probe size still. Okay. So as the last part I presented, um, I would say is a special resolution is quite similar, uh, for, uh, for, for, for those, uh, tactics. Yeah. Okay. Xiaoqing, I think, uh, uh, with that, and with the time consideration, well, thank you so much for your <laughs> amazing talk. I will uh, now circulate back to uh, Bob to conclude today's event. Uh, th thank you, uh, Yi and Xiaoqing, the really uh, beautiful results you're showing. Just to uh, connect with, um, with Wa Chu's uh, uh, field, what is the sort of electron dose which you're using here? Uh, because, uh, as you know, the cryo EM people <coughs> are using something like uh, an electron per square angstrom per second, and so your dose is much must be much higher. Do you, do you know what? Yeah, it's, a, it, it's, it's about a three order magnitudes higher. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we also have uh, Patricia Kuhlman to join us. Uh, you know, just in case. Uh, Patricia has a question, uh, want to participate in discussion. Yeah, I, I just want to uh, uh, say that uh, Xiaoping, thank you, but uh, uh, so the connection between doing this and applying it to biological samples, which of course we'd all want to do at some point in time to get the electron density, yeah. uh, that's still quite a, a long ways away. Yeah, waiting for the uh, low uh, helium holder. So if we have a helium holder and at much lower temperature, maybe you can try a low dose and then you can use a diffraction imaging to analyze something, uh, to study some phenomena which is not possible right at this moment at the room temperature. Well, I think the helium temperatures only reduce the damage further from the liquid nitrogen by a factor less than one and a half. So that's still a long way to go. Um, I think it's interesting what you described that how you bring the density map basically is a current potential 
functions uh, into the chemistry domain. <laughs> Yeah, so that that definitely it's an interesting uh, subject on its own. But right for biological application, actually, may not we we should not wait until lithium uh, a helium coder. So hydrogen coding should be enough because you do not need to have a sub Armstrong probe, uh, as I presented in the last part of my talk. So use a nanometer probe. And, and then the uh, electron pro number of electrons, uh, electron density can be, um, current density can be much lower because uh, you do not need uh, the sub armstrong resolution like us to determine individual atomic column for the molecules uh, in a biological sample. Um, that could be, is worse to try with liquid, liquid, liquid nitrogen holder? Uh, I think one approach would be instead of a single particle, possibly doing uh, uh, <laughs> using a protein crystals. Uh, and then we can use a lower dose to get uh, up to uh, atomic, truly atomic resolution, a fraction and mm -hmm. resolution. So, I mean, one thing I think one can think about doing is actually looking at some organic crystals rather than a, a biological protein mm -hmm. crystal. So that may be something to start thinking about, particularly using the micro year transfection approach. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, let me just uh, conclude the recording part of the session and remind people about uh, next month's uh, February 7th uh, EMX. And uh, we will stay online for a few minutes. We will stop the recording here. Uh, but uh, we'll stay online for any uh, uh, informal discussion for a few more minutes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great, great talks from both speakers. Thank you for having having me. <laughs> Brilliant. So. Uh,